Hi, Shemaine, how are you? Good to see you. Good afternoon, Katie Ann, how are you? Welcome to those who are joining. We'll start in just about five minutes. Good morning, Alejandra. How are you? Alejandra, did you feel the earthquake? What part of California are you in? I thought about you and my California friends. I know it was down in Southern California. Hi, Shanae. I'm doing well, Katie, and thank you. Excellent. Great. No. Okay. Are you up in the Bay Area? I don't remember where you are. Hello. Good morning, Aisha, Orange County. Okay. Okay, I think my head's cut off in this. Let's push it back and see if that works better. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Let me make sure my... Oh, it's Leisha. I'm so sorry. I thought that was an I. Leisha. As in Alicia, or is it just Leisha? Hi, Lisa. Okay, you hear me fine. Excellent. All is well with me. Thank you for asking. I'm just busy as ever, but you know. I know it looks like, uh, it does. It looks like an I. And so I've been calling you Aisha, forgive me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Alicia, are you in the, are you in the course on the email? Very blessed through this course, amen, amen. This course has been a blessing indeed. I thank God for this course. Yes, ma'am, okay. You're just a, a lurker, a silent participant, which is fine. You glean a lot from listening to others. Let us know if you have any questions or comments. Leisha, were you on the all-night prayer? Learning so much. Amen. Amen. And this is my fourth time through this course. It's either number four or five. I think it's I think it's number four, and I'm, I'm still learning. Um. You know, just new ways to look at things. Um, I, I don't know that it's possible to ever learn it all. And so I'm still gleaning new ways to understand and apply. And so much to learn. There's so much to learn. Amen. Amen. And then the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> and unlearn. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? That's the hardest part, unlearning and unlearn. Amen. Amen. That is that is the hardest part to think that you've been doing something correct for all these years to find out you're just... Good afternoon, Sasha. Welcome. We are just um, chatting as we are waiting for our class to begin. Good afternoon, Andrea. God's parenting manual. Amen. And his parenting ways are so simple. And so we have to unlearn all the complex <laughs> ways. Um, hello, blessings, Ma Lay. I feel like that's not your name. Tell us your name. Hi. Oh, hi, Noah. Good afternoon, Sandy. Let's say hello to Jace, little Miss Noah. I've been having that song stuck in my head. Love is a flag flying high. <laughs> because that's what little Miss Noah was singing. Brother Derek. Thank you for joining, Brother Derek. I know, right? <laughs> little Miss Noah. I call her little Miss Firecracker. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, it is noon. And so we are going to jump in. I wonder when we're all getting together. I know. I know. 
we need to we need to have a a retreat or something but um i'm not able to plan a retreat because my plate is full and so we'll either have to wait until we're done with this or someone else can start planning um wouldn't that be awesome but i, I just i can't take on any more projects because i'm just gonna be maxed out and so someone think about it and um make some plans and give some options so i know right all right, guys, so we're going to pray so we can go ahead and get started with our class. We have a lot of material to cover, as always, so please bow with me. Lord, we are so thankful for this opportunity to come together and to discuss the ways that Christ taught. We are so thankful for these ways as we learn to implement them into our everyday life and to learn from the master teacher himself of how to teach our children and those that we come in contact with us. Be with us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> All right, guys, I'm going to get my water so I don't get too overheated. I think I get a little excited when I'm doing these classes. And so kind of raises my body temperature a little bit. All right, so we're going to begin with, we're on page 120. Um, hi, Nicola, how are you? And let me just say, so there was a mistake in the April calendar. So what happened is I have the hard cover of the book. And for some reason... When I was putting the calendar together, I used my book, which is, I don't know, 10 years old, probably older than that. And so the pages after a certain point don't match up. And so I had to redo the cal the, the, um, the calendar to make it fit the, the new manual <coughs> so that the pages that you guys are looking at actually make sense. And so I apologize for that. The new calendar has been posted. I sent it to the group. And so please download the copy of the new calendar. <coughs> okay, hold on, guys. I'm coughing already. All right. Hello to the McFadden family. Welcome. You're welcome, Happy. Okay, so we're going to start with... So what I'm going to do is... I went through, hi Katrina, welcome. I went through each one of the sections that we covered this week and just kind of highlighted some points in each one. So that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna go through each one and just kind of highlight some points and feel free to ask any questions or make comments as we go. So we're on page 120, which is number nine, quoted scriptures. And the first paragraph says, but to every temptation, he had one answer. It is written. He rarely rebuked any wrongdoing of his brothers, but he had a word from God to speak to them. Often he was accused of cowardice or refusing to unite with them in some forbidden act. But his answer was, it is written. To show them the error of what they were doing. And quoting the scripture often put him in the light you know, coward um and i'm sure any of you who have gone to school have been around children you know you've been accused of being scared so that's why you won't do it right um and i i don't know about you but i have made very many dumb decisions in my life um all to prove to someone that i wasn't scared or <laughs> that i wanted to be like everyone else this is really um decisions that were not good and so this is a principle that we want to teach to our children. And this also, this same principle holds true for us as homeschooling parents. We need to know, according to the scriptures, why we're homeschooling, why we're raising our children a certain way, why we don't participate in certain activities. And when someone asks us to do something, then we can give them a word from the scriptures as to why we don't participate in that. And it's not that we think we're better than them. 
right? Um, and it's not even that we're judging them if they do it, but the scriptures are our standard. This is why I do what I do, and this is why I don't do what I don't do. And so we need to be knowledgeable in why we're doing what we're doing so we can have, you know, coherent conversations with people about the choices that we're making and be able to challenge them about the choices that they're making, you know, if it be necessary. Because some people become just very, uh, our safeguard, amen. Some people come become very belligerent and, you know, accuse you of thinking you're better or just all kinds of things that they say. And so we want to know why we're doing what we're doing for everything that we do, right? Be able to answer. Um, okay. And then I wanted to make a note of in the second paragraph towards the bottom. It says he brought a purer atmosphere into the home, into the home life. What kind of atmosphere do we bring into the home? Do our children love it when we're home do they wish we would not be there um i think of a quote that ellen white talks about she says parents do not make your children feel that heaven would not be a lovely place if you were there have mercy have mercy right and so we don't want to um be giving our children a wrong idea of what heaven is going to be like what life on earth should be like what a christian is like you don't want to be giving them false ideas of the love of god and who christ is we want to make sure that we are representing christ correctly and so that will involve being the kind of person that makes the situation better right and i'm sure you can think of people in your life that you're you're having a problem and you just wish that person was there to help you to, to help you calm down to help you think through it to bring peace to the situation we we want to be that person that brings peace and loveliness to our home and that the children identify those characteristics when they think of us all right um The other point is right on the next part of the page, it says, we'll just keep going. Though he did not place himself under the instruction of the rabbis by becoming a student in their schools, yet he was often brought in contact with them and the questions he asked as if he were a learner puzzled the wise men. So I want to make notice of this because when we are teaching our students, when we are witnessing to someone, giving a Bible study, okay, we want to take the position of asking questions for a couple of reasons. One, we don't want to come off as I know what I'm talking about and you don't. Like, I used to do that, right? Like, and just really make the person feel like what they were saying was just you know nonsensical and, and did and it, it probably didn't make any sense right but like it's not okay to make people feel like that now if they feel like that because what you're saying is the truth then that's one thing but we should not be making them feel like that because you're trying to belittle them or trying to take what they're saying that doesn't make sense to us and pull it apart and you know put holes in their theory we don't want to do that we want to ask them questions one to get a sense of where are they what are they thinking where are they getting these thoughts from and um i think it's in it's one of these sections that we um talked about it'll come up because i wrote some notes on it where christ was really good at learning his people learning his subjects the lesson mentioned peter specifically but he studied the countenances of people he, he studied them in particular. Today, we would call it being a people watcher. And so study the countenances of people, especially of your children. When you're talking to them, you're giving them a command, you're, talk, you're giving them instructions. And so you want to watch what makes their eyes light up, what makes them frown, what upsets them. You want to know these things and you want to use observant. Amen. We want to be observant. We want to pay attention to people. <clears throat> and we want to use those things 
in the way that we present things to them, if that makes sense. All right, um, let's go on to, okay, so a few notes that I wrote here for quoted scriptures. Um, when refusing to participate in sin with his brothers, when conversing with the doctors and lawyers of the law, with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, in the synagogue, he read the words of scripture with power. He studied the countenance of a sin. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is that countenance fallen? Amen. And so that points out that he studied the countenance, right? Because <clears throat> he looked at him. He says, why is your countenance fallen? And so we want to notice when people's countenances are fallen, especially when we see them each week. You see people at church. You see people in the neighborhood. Pay attention to people's facial expressions. You know, people commit suicides and everybody's like, I don't know what happened. Mm, usually there were some signs, right? And so we have to be watching um, for these signs and, and for these changes in behavior and, and character. These are, we want to be observant, um, someone said. Um, Leisha, thank you, Leisha. All right, on page... I'm going to move over to page 122 and read, beginning at the bottom. It says, Jesus stood before the people as a living expositor of the prophecies concerning himself. Explaining words he had read, he spoke of the Messiah as a reliever of the oppressed, a liberator of captives, a healer of the afflicted, restoring sight to the blind, and revealing to the world the light of truth. His impressive manner... And the wonderful import of his words thrilled the hearers with a power they had never felt before. The tide of divine influence broke every barrier down like Moses. They beheld the invisible. As their hearts were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, they responded with fervent amens and praises to the Lord. So here he is. Not only is he quoting scripture, he's specifically quoting scripture that is referring to him and they can literally feel the excitement of of him they like they know something's going on and they are moved to say amen in a way that they have never been moved before because he's speaking and he's reading with authority and he is reading in a way that makes sense um with a freshness that is new to them and so they are just amazed at the power with which he reads. Okay. And then it shifts. And it says that once they realize that he was talking about them, conviction. Okay. And once they realize he was talking about them, whoa, whoa. They, they were not too happy. Why? Because if what he's saying is true, <clears throat> then that means that all these years, all this time they have been living in darkness they have been living in error and so you will find this when you start to learn the truth of righteousness by faith of justification of sanctification and you present it to people who have not been living a life of victory and then they realize that if what you're saying is true then that means that what they have believed is a lie and that they have not been living the life of victory, um, you, you will get a lot of pushback and just a lot of disdain and all kinds of things. And so, you know, that's what happens when you shine the light on, on people who feel like they've been doing it right and are, and are not open to learning the truth. And so I, I just found it very interesting when I was reading that. It's like, wow. So anyway, he used the scriptures to show them that, like this was talking about them, I felt like that leaving Sunday to become a Sabbath worship, worshiper. What, that you, that you had believed a lie? What was it that you felt like? All right, and so we're gonna move on to, yes, mm-hmm. So I felt the same way. I grew up as missionary Baptist. Believe a lie was a struggle. I grew up as a missionary Baptist. 
Um, I think I got baptized when I was about six or seven. Um, I stayed in that church until I was about 18, until I left for, until I left for college. And, um, you know, it, it was a struggle to, to let go of, of many things that I had learned. Even when I, quote, accepted the truth, I accepted it just kind of as an addition to, to what I already knew. Right. It was very hard for me to replace what, what I had learned. Like I tried to keep as much as what I had already knew in place. And then I was just going to add to. Um, and, and that is just not that's not Christianity. And there's not truth that like you you have to replace. And that's what we're learning in this course. Right. Things that we have learned. And the way that we have been taught is just not true. And it, it doesn't bring victory. And so we wonder why we struggle. And it's because we haven't known the truth. And so we have to be open to, like, that's painful to know that you've been doing things all these years. And now your children are a mess because you made them a mess. Right? That is painful. Like, that, that, is, that is a hard pill to swallow. But, you know, praise God that he redeems the time. And so that's where the unlearning comes in. Amen. 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 Very painful. And you're st we're still learning. And you and you will just learn until you die. You will. And then when you are resurrected, or if you're translated, in all of eternity, we'll still be learning. That's We'll still be learning. The plan of salvation about God, we will, for all of eternity, <laughs> we will still be learning. And so even what we're learning now is just the crumbs. And then we'll actually get the bread <laughs> when we get to heaven. Amen. Amen. Okay, I missed that last comment. My computer has frozen again you guys pray for my computer all right so let's go on to ask questions um it says here that at the bottom well let's just talk about the fact that he asked questions and this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about when we are when we're witnessing someone when we're teaching our children we want to ask questions and we're not questioning them like you know like we're not a lawyer like this is not an interrogation we're asking questions thought questions questions to promote discussion questions to promote thought questions that maybe we know they haven't considered and that they came to this point of view because they haven't considered this question okay and so we're just we're, we're just facilitating discussion and thought and this is what christ was genius at obviously he was genius at everything but when he asked questions it says i wrote in my notes he asked questions regarding the prophecies concerning him and at the bottom of page 124 on the right hand side it says but they did not discern that he had access to the tree of life a source of knowledge of which they were ignorant so so why is this important for a few reasons one god can teach us more in a moment in one day than we could learn in a lifetime and so we have to own the fact that we don't know everything there is much to learn and when we come to the feet of jesus amen he is a willing teacher the holy spirit is a willing teacher we can be taught if we come with a humble spirit, with an attitude of, of willingness, of realizing that we don't know it all. And when we learn from the tree of life, what we're learning, how we're learning it, how we present it to others will bear fruit of where we got our knowledge from okay and so that's when that's why when the disciples came out um you know people they were trying to hide the fact that they had been with jesus but they couldn't hide it because they were te they were learners of him and he taught them everything they needed to know and the way that he taught translated over into their character into the way that they were now teaching, into the way that they were delivering truth. And so people were able to look at them and say, hey, 
you guys have been with that man. And, you know, of course, Peter was like, I don't even know him. Um, but at first, right? And then he got to the point where he would rather obey God if it cost his life than to go against the commandments of God. And so the point is, we want the tree of life, the knowledge of God to be our source of wisdom and understanding. And obviously this includes the Bible. These are things that we're going to learn in our time with God that are not going to go against the Bible, right? So God's going to give me a thought, but it's going to be in harmony with his word because he is, Christ is the word. And so what he says to me is not going to go against who he is or the instructions or information that he has left for me to, to understand and know him, okay? And so if I have a thought, then I can know whether it comes from, from God or not but whether or not it harmonizes with the word, to the law and the testimony, Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, because it's because there is no light in them. All right, and that wasn't even speaking of the New Testament. That was speaking of the Old Testament law um, because all the, tech, all the scriptures harmonize, and so we can go even back to Genesis most times and, and figure out of what we have been told or what we have heard or what someone else has said, it has come from God or not. All right, um, let's see. Okay, so under the ask questions, on the next page on 125, it talks about the woman from Samaria. So Christ, in his infinite wisdom, doesn't ask her, does she want a cup of water? Because she could have easily said, oh, no, thank you, and gone on about her merry way. But he asked her to get him a cup of water. And this grabbed her attention. Because why would this person be talking to me like we do not get along? There's racial tension in the town. Um, these folks don't talk to these folks. And so, like, why, why is he even talking to me, first of all? Um, because I'm a woman and because I'm a Samaritan woman. And so he studied this woman. He studied the customs of the time. And he knew exactly how to engage her, how to get her attention. And he used that. And it worked. Um, and then he was able to have an entire conversation with her, all because he knew how to begin the conversation. And so when we are doing our lesson plans, when we are in the grocery store, in wherever we go, that we interact with people, we want to know how to start up conversations with people. If you're standing in the grocery line, someone's standing behind you, look for opportunities. Um, people, people will strike up conversations with you. And then this gives you the opportunity to share the gospel or to share something that will plant a seed. Maybe, maybe it's not your job to, to bring them to Christ, but you're planting the seed that someone else is going to water and then God's going to bring the harvest. Amen. And so we want to look for these times to, to converse with people, to, um, to, to take their minds toward heaven. And we want to do that with their children as we are in the home, outside in the garden, in the backyard, what, wherever we may be, that we are planting seeds even in them and pointing their mind heavenward and asking them questions that provoke thoughts and make them think for themselves, especially when the children have come and they want to do something that we don't do. Mommy, can we go to this party? Well, when is it? On Sabbath? Uh, now, why are you asking me that? <laughs> right? Like, we're not going to say, why are you asking me that? That is not the answer, Mommy. That's not the answer, Daddy. We're going to say, well, what do you think? Well, what, is the, you know, what, what would Jesus do? What, what does the Bible say? We're going to ask them questions so they can reason whether or not, and maybe it's not even on Sabbath. Maybe it's just a part that's not appropriate to go to, okay? We, we want to reason with them and give them the tools that are necessary to be able to reason out whether or not they should be participating in this activity. But we, want, we don't want to always just tell them yes or no, but we want them to think through the process of why the answer should be yes or no. All right, any questions or comments? Let's move on to taught truth. And I think we're right on schedule about halfway through. Um, 
It was his work to present the truth. His word shed a flood of light upon the teachings of patriarchs and prophets, and the scriptures came to men as a new revelation. Do we allow them to make their own decisions? Okay. Never before had his hearers perceived such a depth of meaning in the word of God. So, I don't know that I would say we're allowing them to make their own decisions. It depends on what it is. Um, you know, if if it's going to a party on Sabbath, then they're, they're not going to go, right? But I, I think the point that I'm making is that we want them to be involved in the reasoning process and hopefully they will come to the conclusion on their own that they should not go. But if they don't, then we can now reason with them through the scriptures of why they should not go and why they cannot go, right? Um, but if, if done correctly, then most of the time they will come to the right conclusion that you may want to go, but you cannot substantiate with the word that you should go, okay? And so that's another lesson in and of itself because we have to understand how the plan of salvation works and how God saves us. And sometimes we get so caught up on focusing on what people want to do. Well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't think that. Oh, okay, like we could say that, but if they think that, then to say that you shouldn't think that, like that's not really helping me, okay? Principle is to allow them to be a thinker, not a mere reflector of other men's thoughts. Amen, amen. And so I will go back to, so that they don't grow up saying I did not do it because my mom told me to do it. Amen, amen. We, we don't want them to do things or not do things because I said so and you're gonna do what I said. Now there is a time to tell the child because I said so. Because you need to do it now and you need to not question me and you need to get it done. There's a time to say that. But even then, the child needs to be able to come back and we need to be able to have a conversation about why they had to do what they had to do. And I really need to know why you don't know that you need to do that. Like, because I need to know why you don't understand that this is necessary for you to do and that you should have already done it probably and I shouldn't even be having to ask you to do it. But there's a time to have that conversation, which is usually after you get it done, because I need to see that you're obedient. And then now we can discuss, you know, why you needed to be obedient or whatever we're discussing. Um, but the, the story that I want to refer you to is the story of the rich young ruler. So the, the problem with the rich young ruler is not that he loved money. Like, that's not the problem. Obviously, that is the problem, right? Because he loved the money more than he loved the people. He loved money more than he loved God. But the problem with the rich young ruler is that he would not submit his love of money to Christ. So Christ doesn't turn us away because we love things more than him. Like, do you guys see what I'm saying? Like, if, if we had to love him first, then we wouldn't need him. The reason we need him is because we love other things more than we love him. And then we're going to learn of him. And then he's going to teach us even how to love him because of the way that he loves us. And so that's why we study his great sacrifice. And we learn to love as he loved so that now we can love him the way that we're supposed to. But we, we don't come to him like that. We, we come to him knowing that we are messed up, we, we love things, we love ourselves, uh, we love other people more than we love God. And so we come to him with that baggage, with those hangups, with that sin. We come to him so that he can cleanse us. So what the rich young ruler should have said is, Lord, I do love this money more than you. But can you teach me how to love you more than my money, right? Like if he had said that, then he would have been, Christ would have shown him the way of salvation. So I just, I want to make sure we understand that the problem is not that he loved the money, right? That's why he needed Jesus because he loved the money. <laughs> like that's, that's what Jesus does. He came to save sinners, right? So, 
okay? So why do you go to the physician? Because you need healing. The problem is not that you have a disease. The problem is that you wouldn't go to the doctor to get help. The problem is that you wouldn't stop eating the stuff that you know is killing you, right? The problem is not that you have the disease. The problem is now you have information on how to cure the disease. He didn't surrender to Christ. Amen. In a nutshell. So the problem is not that we have sin. The problem is that we will not give our sin to Jesus. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. Everybody. That includes me. Everybody. All have sinned. And so now I have to bring my sin. What does, that, what does the hymn say? I lay my sin on Jesus. Amen. I don't keep it. Because if I keep it, I'm going to be lost. I acknowledge that I have it. I don't want it. Right? So first I have to say, Lord, I don't want the sin. I don't want it. Can you show me how to give it to you? Lord, I don't want it. It's killing me. It's killing me. I don't want it. And so then God is going to teach us how to give to him the very thing that's killing us. That's what the plan of salvation is. Lord, teach me how to give to you this thing that I'm holding on to that I don't know how to let go because I don't know why we hold on because we like it because I don't know. Anyway, the point is we need to give it to God to allow him to cleanse us. And so we don't say to people, well, you shouldn't think like that. Mm, well, they do think like that. That's why they need Jesus. Amen. Okay. And so we don't say to our children, well, you shouldn't think that. Okay. So that we have to teach the child how to give their thoughts to Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So now they can have new thoughts. Amen. Okay. When Satan brings on a flood up against us, God raises up a standard against him. Jesus Christ, when lifted up, will draw us unto him. Amen. Amen. And that's what we're teaching people, Karen. How to lift up Jesus so that others will be drawn to him. So that the sin that was once in us, that was once a part of us, is no more. Because we have laid it on Jesus. And he He didn't just die for us um, or live for us to show us, to do it for us. He did it so that we could see how it could be done. And through his power, now we can do it because it's him doing it through us. It's him doing it. It's Christ within. So now he's in me. So it's not me doing it. It's him doing it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, where were we? Taught truth. So I'm going to read... On page 128, it says, Christ seldom attempted to prove that truth is truth. He illustrated truth in all its bearings and then left his hearers free to accept or reject it as they might choose. He did not force anyone to believe. In the Sermon on the Mount, he instructed the people in practical godliness, distinctly outlining their duty. He spoke in such a manner as to commend truth to the conscience. The power manifested by the disciples was revealed in the clearness and earnestness which, which, with which they expressed the truth. In Christ's teaching, there is no long, far-fetched, complicated reasoning. He comes right to the point. In his ministry, he read every heart as an open book. And from the inexhaustible store of his treasure house, he drew things both new and old to illustrate and enforce his teachings. He touched the heart and awakened the sympathies. So here we are. I hope you guys see how the, really the kind of the same points are being brought out. So he did not seek to force people to believe that what he was saying was true. He lived the truth. And so now people's interest are piqued. Now they want to know what he's talking about. Now they want to understand how he's living because, number one, the way that he spoke it was with conviction. It was with power, okay? So you want to be debt-free? Are you going to listen to the person who has $300,000 worth of debt? Probably not because all they're going to be able to teach you is how not to get into debt. That's not really going to help me get out of debt. Okay, so like that's not the lesson that I need to know. Now that might be some good information, but that's that's not going to help me get out of the mess that I'm in. And so you want to talk to people who know what they're talking about, 
who have lived it, who have experienced it, who can show you, I, I have learned this truth, I have lived it, and it has benefited me exactly the way that it's supposed to benefit me. And that's what Christ was. He was a walking revelation of the word. And so people saw in him truth because he was the truth. And so when he spoke the truth, it had power because he lived it, right? And so now he's teaching his disciples. And now when they're learning the lessons, they go out in the same power as them that attend that attended Christ because they have learned how to accept the power that is offered. What does it say? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so with this belief in Christ, it's not just, oh, I believe God died for my sins, so now I'm going to be saved. No, with this belief comes power. And so if I believe, now my life shows that I believe. Why? Because my life has changed. It's not the same. So if, you're be if you believe that Toyota's giving away free cars and you don't have a car, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? So if you believe that they're giving away free cars, then I need to see you driving your brand new car. And then guess what? Now I'm going to go get mine because I believe you because you believe and then you went and got your car. Okay? So when we believe... It prompts us to action. So, okay, if people, are, if somebody's giving away a million dollars, but I'm broke, then okay. So, if they're giving it away, like, how come you don't have it? And so, we need we need to be able to show that what we believe is true, because our life is, amen, amen, because our life is <laughs> is a manifestation of the truth that we believe, amen. All right, let's move on to. God the center. How are we doing? Oh, we're doing great, guys. All right. God the center. What was the central thing? Okay. I love this book because I keep looking over here. Yet he was earnest rather than vehement. He spoke as one who had a definite purpose to fulfill. He was bringing to view the realities of the eternal world and everything God was revealed. Jesus sought to break the spell of infatuation, which keeps men absorbed in earthly things. He placed the things of this life in their true relation as subordinate to those of eternal interest. But he did not ignore their importance. He taught that heaven and earth are linked together and that a knowledge of divine truth prepares men better to perform the duties of everyday life. He spoke as one familiar with heaven, conscious of his relationship to God, yet recognizing his unity with every member of the human family. So... What this says to me is balance. So he put things of heaven in their perspective, which is in, in the front, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So it doesn't mean you don't work, right? So we don't say, well, I just believe God's going to provide dinner for me, and then we just sit at the dinner table, and then dinner is going to magically appear. No, no. But... We also don't believe that this job that we're working is what is sustaining us. It's not the job. It's God who has provided the job, <clears throat> who has provided me with the health to be able to work the job. And so I have to keep in perspective how these things work. One second. All right. So on the right-hand side, it says, is health an important subject if one does not distinguish the mighty healer. And so I thought about the forks over knives. Um, what's the other one? I don't know. There's a few of them. Forks over knives is the one that comes most prominent to my mind. Great program. Lots of people have reversed diabetes, hypertension, um, have avoided strokes. But where's the mention of God? And so we don't want to have... A health message that is devoid of the divine doctor of the master healer what the hell what the hell great documentary okay my brother went vegan for six months all because he watched that movie but where's God fat sick and nearly dead that's another one so these are 
documentaries of people who have changed their diets and their health has benefited. Amen. No questions. We can't even, you know, contend with it. Like the facts are the facts. They gave up animal products and they are living more healthy lives. But we don't want them to be healthy sinners, right? So if being healthy is just going to give you more energy to do things you shouldn't be doing, that's not really the health message, right? Now you feel better, but now you just feel better to commit more evil. No, no. So we need a health message that is centered in Christ, that is balanced in Christ, that points us to God. And so that's why the health message is the right arm of the gospel. Because if you can make people feel better, they will listen to any doctrine that you're preaching. If you can take their diabetes that they have had for 30 years and tell them to eat something or not eat something and then reverse that thing, and then now you want to tell them about Jesus, they're going to listen to you. Why? Because they know you know what you're talking about. And so if, if you told me this and it worked, now you tell me this. You told me this about my physical condition. Now you're going to tell me this about my spiritual condition. And so they're going to listen because God is going to clear their mind. And he's working at, at both ends, right? He was working in their physical healing. He's also working in their spiritual healing. And so it gives us the, the access to the heart whereby we might present the gospel to those who are in need. We can't benefit from the laws of nature, but we should prosper in health as our soul prospers. Amen. Amen. Because we, what, what does it help us to be in perfect health and then to be lost, right? Yeah, we, we don't want that. All right. So, as it relates to our schooling, we want Christ to be the center of every subject, of, of every principle, of every conversation, of um, even the doctrines that we believe. We, we want to learn how to center them in Christ. So, yes, the seventh day is the Sabbath, but what does that have to do with God? We want to think of the Sabbath as a time to, to spend with God, as a time to, to rejuvenate, to reconnect, to serve. We want Christ to be the center of every single thing that we believe. And sometimes it takes practice to be able to do that because we, we can teach a whole doctrine and never even mention Christ. But we, we don't want to do that because Christ is the central theme of everything. And so we want to reevaluate how we think about things with Christ being the focal point and then everything else kind of branches out uh, from that. All right, let's move on to illustrations. So this is a really, if it's when we keep our eyes on Jesus solely, we don't even think of self. Amen, amen. And so we learn to, to point our mind heavenward. And what does the hymn say? The things of this earth will grow strangely dim. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Amen, amen. With, with every portion of of our being the health message is the right arm of the gospel but this way of veganism independent of gospel is just a double time to hinder the effect of the combination amen amen and isn't that what he does he takes truth and then he mingles it with a little falsehood that's what he does and so that that's that's what a lot of these messages that we're seeing are so obviously there's a lot of truth to them but if it doesn't include God, it's not the whole truth. Amen? All right. So let's talk about illustrations. And we know that Christ used illustrations. Many of his parables were illustrations using coins, using sheep, um, trees, flowers, pretty much everything you can think of that has to do with nature. He, he used in some kind of way. And... We're told that at the bottom it says, notice how often Jesus used the natural instead of the artificial when teaching. And then it makes the example of learning to um, studying birds instead of 
airplanes. So that doesn't mean that you don't study airplanes. It just means that if you were to look at the airplane, you would look at it in light of how the bird is designed, right? The bird would be your main focus. And then now maybe you study other things that were designed after the pattern of how the bird is crafted, right? Um, and so that's where the balance comes in. So we're not saying that you can't study airplanes, but you know, the, the person who modeled the airplane, they studied the birds. And so we want to study the birds. Many beautiful lessons in studying the birds. So one thing that we have to unlearn, and I find a lot when I'm talking to parents about how to implement school in the home, um, and not just bringing school home, but really doing homeschool. And what's the difference? So one difference is, you're teaching your child about money. So school at home would be to get a worksheet that has quarters, nickels, dimes on it. And so now you've seen them. It's got the little picture of the quarter. It's got a little picture of the nickel. And on the side, it asks, how much money is this? And so now the child is looking at the little coins on the page. No, no. So why are we going to look at coins on the page when we probably have coins in our purse? And guess what? If we don't have any coins in that purse, we should go to the bank and take $5 and get some coins so that we can teach our children how to use money using actual real money. So don't substitute worksheets for what you can do in real life. So don't have the child circle socks on the page. No, we're going to do laundry and we're going to match the socks in real life. And so we're, we're going to do things. And so does that mean we don't use worksheets? It doesn't mean we don't use worksheets. But we don't really need worksheets, right? And if we use them, they should not be a replacement from using real life objects to, to teach principles. And so I see this, especially in my math students. I'm a t I tutor math. And because we live in pretty much a cashless society, the little children, third, fourth, fifth grade, money concepts are foreign to them. So I asked my little students, so simple, but such a revelation, right? So I asked my little student, I said, well, how many dimes are in a dollar? And we're on, we're on FaceTime. She's looking at me. And just like this. She's like, she has no idea what I'm talking about. And I'm just like, what? And so she's guessing. So then I'm changing it up. You know, okay, how many nickels? Like, she just is looking at me like, Miss Yolanda, like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, and so we can teach so many different concepts just by basic things that we have around the home. Like, you, you don't need a curriculum. You, it's just, just teach your child what you know. And so this is what you're going to be doing in the in the first seven, eight years of life. Like your, your children should know there's 10 dimes in a dollar. They should know there's 20 nickels. They should know that a, a nickel is half of a dime. Okay, and obviously I'm speaking American currency. But you guys get the point of what I'm saying. Wherever you live, whatever kind of currency you use, the principles are still the same. You have something that's probably one-tenth of your main dollar, right? You have something that's one, one hundred. You know, you use so that's fractions so you can use time to teach fractions right so time is based on the the six or 60 but 15 minutes is a quarter of an hour so that means 15 is one fourth of 60 like you don't you don't need a college degree to know that all you need to do is a clock okay so if you if you only have digital clocks in your house get an analog clock you should have at least one analog clock in your home or buy the child a watch that's not digital that is analog so they can look at the face of that time um watch and be learning spatial and co concepts okay and so you haven't really taught anything but you have does that make sense all right and so we're going to use illustrations we're going to use real life to teach concepts as far as possible and if if there's something that we don't have in real life Okay, we can use a book. Amen for books. I'm not. A, I love books, but we're learning about flowers. We're gonna go to Home Depot and we're gonna plant some flowers, or just walk around Home Depot. They got all kinds of flowers. That's how my daughter learned to count by fives using 
Amen. 5, 10, 15, 20, all the way up to 60, right there on the clock. That's what I'm talking about. That's how you teach the fives. With money, with niggles, and with the clock. Okay? That's how we teach it. And you don't need a curriculum for that. Do you know how to tell time? Then teach a child how to tell time. Okay? And now you've had a whole math lesson. Write that down in your little notebook and you're done. With, for the, okay? Amen. All right. Um, I think that's really, that's really it for that one. Love it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's go to, we've got a couple more. Okay. I think we're doing all right. I think we might actually make it go. <laughs> all right. Repeat it. Notice how Jesus did not bring many things to the people's mind at once and also use repetition. repetition. So I hope you guys have seen this one topic like demonstrated by the way that I try to teach you. And I try not to just repeat things just for repetition's sake, but to show you how everything goes together so we learn about one concept, we learn about another concept. So now I'm going to repeat to you the first concept we learned so you can see how it links to the second concept, okay? So this is what we want to do when we're teaching our children. We want to focus on one thing. So that's why in the lessons, you're focusing on a character quality. You have one focus and you want to teach that principle and you want to teach it well because we teach for mastery. So I had someone ask me the other day, um about writing and like how do you grade your child's writing so you know honestly when when my children write especially when my daughter was writing so that like, you don't even get a grade till it's right i just give it back to you and i tell you what's wrong with it or i would give her some general ideas um you know you're not using your commas properly um, you're not capitalizing properly. Just whatever the issue is. So now you have to go back and correct the paper. Like I'm not even putting a grade on it because I haven't accepted it. Because it's not acceptable. And so you're not even going to move on from this paper until it's worthy for me to put an A on it. And so like we, like we're not, you're not making B's because this is not regular school. Like we're not on a time schedule. We are on a time schedule, but not in the way that children in school are on a time schedule, you know, I have to get through this. And so even when we worked um, math problems, so every problem has to be correct. And so maybe you didn't get it right the first time, but this paper is not done until it has been corrected. So if you look at my children's old notebooks, like there's no problems that they work that are in there incorrect because they have to, because you have to fix that. And so what it teaches them is, you're going to have to do it correctly anyway. You might as well take a little time and do it right the first time because you're just wasting your time because you're going to have to correct it, right? And so if they were just stuck and they didn't understand it, then that might indicate to me that maybe they didn't teach it well. Maybe they're just not getting it. And so we might need to go back and spend a little more time on these concepts. But we, we don't accept papers that, that, are, that are not A quality. Like that's just not... Um, that that is something that you have to unlearn because that that is Babylonian that that is pagan So so when you get a C so you just go on to the next class. Oh, no, mm -mm. <laughs> no, ma'am If you got a C that in this house C is failing So no you when you understand it, then we move on to the next topic I mean, that's just there's there's no reason to do it. So your children should not be making C's um, They really shouldn't even be making B's they they need to do it correctly and they need to show that they understand. And if they don't understand, then they need to spend more time on it, right? The focus becomes learning how to solve it versus... Exactly, exactly. We we don't want to just be, well, I'm just trying to get by. Because that's the mentality that I had as a school child. And my teacher, my 11th grade teacher, she put me out of her class. Because I was acceptable with C's. And she's like, you're not a C student and you're not going to stay in my class making C's. And she put me in a class with the regular children. Have mercy. It was the worst thing that happened to me. <laughs> and it scarred me. Like, I was so devastated. And then I go to this class where they're like, so we're doing like papers and all kinds of thought process. And then I go over here and they're doing spelling words. I'm like, what kind of class is this? But anyway, she 
I wish she had handled it differently, but I appreciate her her principle of if you're not going to do your best, then you're not going to be allowed to be in my class. And I have never forgotten that lesson. Um, and so, anyway, and I learned. <laughs> but what a hard lesson to learn. She put me out of her class. Okay. All right, repeat it. That's where we are. So, oh, this is the other point. My daughter gets frustrated when I make her go back and take her time. And so now, Shanae, we have to we have to deal with that because why are you getting frustrated because I'm making you take your time? Why wouldn't you want to take your time and do your best? Mommy is helping you to do your best because you can do better than this on this paper, okay? And what we do is we slap God in the face when we don't do our best because he has given us this intellect he has given us the ability. So let me just say this. I I was I had this class. I think it was it was one of my math classes in in, in high school. Analytic geometry, algebra two is one of those classes. And I was a poor student. I was the student who I wouldn't even remember we had a test until like right before class. And then I would open my book and try to study just so I could pass. Like that's the kind of student I was. And so there was this girl in my class who like she studied so hard she would do all the homework problems she would read all the pages she would work the examples and she would take the test and she would get a c like her best effort was like she was barely passing this class okay and she she did not like me because i didn't even care because i'm throwing away my gift right and so of course now i'm learning this lesson that i squandered but the, what is the point? The point is God has gifted some of us that we can halfway do it and get by. And the system that we grew up in teaches us that that's acceptable. So you get a C and you go on to the next class and you can graduate with that 2.0. No, no, no. I wish someone had sat me down and said, this is unacceptable. Why? Because if you're an A student, and you're making C's, that's not acceptable because you're not being the person that God created you to be. And so we want our children to know that their best is the only thing that's acceptable, whatever that best is. If I know you tried your best and you got a C, okay, y'all know what I'm talking about. Some classes you gave it all you had and praise the Lord you got a C. And you just, you, you, you studied everything, you read everything, you did some extra reading and you just couldn't pull it off. Life is like that sometimes, but that's okay because you gave it everything you had. That C is only acceptable if you gave it everything you have and that's all you could pull off. Amen. But the truth be told, if we give it everything we have, we're probably not going to be making C's. We're just probably not. Okay? Not giving him the answers, but being sort of his cheerleading. Amen. 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 Okay? So we, we want to... We want to reevaluate and make sure our children are not comfortable with mediocrity, okay? Because mediocre people are not going to be in heaven, okay? Because you can't be mediocre and have victory over sin. It's not possible. If you if you have been mediocre and you have victory over sin, call me. Call me because I want to know, okay? You, you cannot be mediocre and have victory over sin. It's not even possible. It's not even possible. Mercy on mediocrity being rewarded with A's for cramming. Okay. Okay. And you knew you crammed and you knew you weren't a good student. These are the things that we have to unlearn because we've been getting by. And then guess what? Now we come to the gospel and we try to cram and it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> it don't work. It doesn't work. And so we have to learn a new way because God's ways are not the ways that we have learned he god's ways are consistency god's ways are when when the gospel changes you you're not gonna have your stuff just looking any kind of way you're not gonna do it i was riding around today before i got on here i had to go back through my car because there was little we live under all these trees and there was all these little piney it was driving me crazy y'all it's like okay i was like i hope i'm not late for the call because i have to go back through my car like i just i couldn't take it 
I know that's not even me because before I would have just driven around and with those sort of pine needles all up under my feet crunching and it wouldn't have bothered me. <laughs> but now it bothers me, right? Because this is this is not reflective of, of what God has taught me and what he's doing for my life. So, all right. Um, okay, guys, I think we are just about done. I'm just going to cover, I'm just going to talk about, we kind of talked about study countenances. So I'm going to skip that one because I think we covered that. And we're going to go on to um, the last thing that I'm just going to talk about briefly, and then I'm going to let you go, is socialize. So this is so important because this reading shows the balance of socialization, which is exactly what we want to have. Um, and this is one of the, the comments that we get or the questions that we get as a homeschooler, right? Well, how are your children going to be socialized? Like going to school with all 10 year olds is being socialized. Like that is false socialization. But what we want to see is the balance in socialization that Christ had <clears throat> because he accepted invitations from people that invited him to their home. He went. But why did he go? Because he was on a mission. He was not going there for entertainment. He was not going there to have a good time. That doesn't mean that you won't have a good time. It doesn't mean he didn't have a good time, but that's not why he was going, okay? So our focus has to be in the right place. So this person has invited me to their house. Why am I going? Am I going because I want them to serve me? Am I going so I can be a service to others? And I remember this lady who... um. She kind of has a ministry with, with healthy foods. I'll just say that because if I say too much, y'all don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and she was complaining because she would go to these, she eat what I, what I brought. But that kind of thinking means so that we have missed the point. Uh oh, guys, did I lose you? Okay, my screen has frozen. Are you guys still there? Oh no. Okay, I see the time moving. You guys are still there? Okay, my screen has frozen, but I'll just I'll wrap this up so we can go. Um so she asked a question of what kind of socialization is that? You know, if, if I can only eat the food that I've brought. But she missed the point of, okay, you can't see me and hear me. Okay, I can't see my, my screen. is Okay, I'll keep going. She missed the point of why are we going to these functions? I'm not coming so I can eat your food. If I can eat your food, amen, praise the Lord. Th there's nothing wrong with that. But... We should not go to these social activities with the intention that we're going to be served. We should go with a heart of service. And so if I can only eat what I brought to eat, then amen, I can eat something because I brought it, right? And so we, we want to change the way that we're thinking of this socialization and this interaction with others. And what is our purpose when we are going to interact with others? All right. Um, I think that's really it, guys. So that ends socialization, study countenances. We talked about that. I think that's really it. I think we've covered pretty much everything that we covered this week. So thank you guys for joining. We will pray to um, end our session. Lord, we are so thankful for the topics that we have covered the ways that we have learned of Christ and how he trained his disciples, how he studied the countenances of others, how he used nature to illustrate beautiful truths. Lord, help us to be this kind of teacher. Help us to learn to have Christ form within that it will not be us, but it will be Christ who teaches our students, who teaches even us, 
who interacts with those that we come in contact with us, that as Christ is lifted up, indeed, all men will be drawn as has been promised in the word. I ask a special blessing on everyone who has joined here today, those who will watch um, at a later time, those who were not able to join but wish they could. Lord, help us to be ready for the soon coming of Christ. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. Well, I will see you later. We will meet on Sunday at 7. So just a reminder, we are not meeting on Sun. On, I'm sorry. We're not meeting on Saturdays and we're not meeting on Fridays in the morning. And so I noticed that a few of you have been calling in, but there is no meeting on Friday because we are done with the 40 days. And so we're only meeting on Sunday through Thursday at 7 a.m. And then on Friday at noon here on the YouTube channel. So happy Sabbath. God be with you all. Um, Sabbath blessings to those who have already entered Sabbath and for those who are preparing. And we will meet again on Sunday morning. All right. Bye-bye. Happy Sabbath.